Before, this is, by the way, this is what the, um, the introductory uh, menu looks like for the sunset classes that we've been using downstairs, for those of you who haven't been in one. Uh, and this is the class that the Wednesday night group just finished this spring. Uh, I got tugged on by students in the class saying, you really need to hear this one. Went down, listened to uh, Lauren expound on the video, then watched the video and agreed that this is something quite powerful and quite significant. And it's like, it's right down the, the pike of where we are in our thinking and, and what conversations that the elders have been having. So this is not a, a, a done deal, and this is not a directive. This is a very healthy thing that I think congregations can and should do. Are there any questions before I begin the video? Any questions? Okay. Welcome to our last study in discussing mission principles as they are found in the Old and in the New Testament particularly. Our last study today deals with what's called in the Bible the house in their home, the church in their home, what we call house churches or small groups. This is a very valid mission principle. The church will never rapidly grow, it will never multiply if we're depending upon the celebration. That's what we do on Sunday morning when we all come together and sing and pray and eat the Lord's Supper and preach and communicate our love for one another, but particularly our praise for God. Or if we only depend upon what might be called the congregations, the Bible classes, the large groups of 30 and 40 and 50 and 100 or 200 or 500 people that gather to be filled with the Word of God. One in one really in all, in, uh enables us to enjoy the praise to God. And the other one fills us with the word of God. But until we get down to that small group where we can intimately relate and where we can bring our friends and neighbors to intimately relate to God and to one another, the church will never reach that multiplying level. Now there's been abuses made of this concept of small group or house churches. And so there are some fears that hinder people from doing that. Some people say that if we break up into small groups, we'll wind up with a divided church. Many little cliques all going their own way. Now, there is a danger in that. But that danger resides in the heart and in the attitude and not in necessarily in the small group concept. Some have also thought that this would cause us maybe to go off into false doctrines or traditions different from the mainstream. Again, that's a danger that we need to be aware of, but it doesn't need to be a fear that hinders us. Some have thought that we might go off into certain legalistic or even psychological excesses. Again, that is a danger. Anytime that we get together and look one another in the face, that danger exists. But it still needs to be just a danger we're aware of and not a fear that hinders us. Now, to me, there are some facts that not only help but make it absolutely necessary that we become involved in small group work. I want to suggest to you that it is the New Testament pattern of doing things. Turn to the book of Acts chapter 2 and notice with me that after Peter has preached his first sermon and 3,000 people have become obedient to the gospel of Christ, that it says in verse 42, they, that is the people that were added to their number, about 3,000, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want you to notice that there was a corporate meeting. They met together in the temple courts. I want you to notice that there was a larger group but still not in the home as they continued in the apostles' 
teaching. There's at least 12 then Bible classes going on sometime during the day, every day, as the apostles were teaching. But he climaxed by saying that they broke bread in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. And then and only then does he say, and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. We've not restored the New Testament order until we have a celebration where everybody gets together to celebrate their faith. Until we have large groups that we might call congregations that are meant to study the Word of God. And until we have small groups meeting in homes to take that Word and make it real and practical and be able to live it day by day out on the street. We need to worship. We need to study. We need to share. And all of that's happening before we leave Acts chapter 2. Notice in chapter 5 of Acts, let's just take a quick trip through the book of Acts and other places in the New Testament and see that this is not some invention. This is actually the New Testament order. In chapter 5 of the book of Acts, verse 41 and 42, it's the apostles have been beaten for Christ. And they rolled out onto the dusty, sandy, Jerusalem street and they're told you don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus or we'll kill you the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name day after day in the temple courts large group and from house to house small group they never stopped teaching and proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ notice in chapter 5 we've got the large group and the small group. Look at chapter 12 of the book of Acts. In chapter 12 and verse 12, Peter's in prison. He's been released from prison. And notice what he said, what chapter 12, 11 and 12 says. Now Peter came to himself and he says, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this dawned on him, he went to, the house of, went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Notice, again, he knew where the brethren would be. They wouldn't be down at the temple. They will be in Mary's house. In chapter 16 of the book of Acts, Paul is in prison. He is released from prison, and notice where he goes as soon as he is released. Verse 40. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. And then they left. Notice that the order is again that the brethren will be together in a house. This time it's the house of Lydia. And this goes all the way through the book of Acts until we get to the last chapter. And in chapter 28, Paul establishes a teaching post in his house for two whole years Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and without hindrance he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus from chapter 2 all the way through chapter 28 the book of Acts has the example of them meeting at homes now turn over to Romans and let's see that that's also true nearly a generation later near the end of Paul's life on the third missionary journey as he writes this book the book of Romans we find him greeting 27 people in the first 20 verses of this book and notice several times he talks about churches in their house verse 3 greet Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus they risk their lives for me not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Then notice, if you will, on down in verse 14, here's some words that really are tongue twisters. He says, Greet us and Cretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brother with them. Then the next verse, verse 15, Greet Philogius, Julia, Nerus, and her sister, Olympus, and all the saints with them, all the churches of Christ, send their greetings. Notice here were brethren, and then the brethren with them. It's interesting to me that the New Testament example, the New Testament pattern, 
is small groups. In Colossians 4 and verse 15, he says, greet the church that meets in Nympha's house. In Philemon verse 2, he speaks of the church that is in Philemon's house. Now these were not separate congregations. These were small groups within the large group. These were churches within the church. If you will imagine three concentric circles. There's first of all this celebration, this biggest of groups where all the brethren come together. And then within that, there are several Bible classes or congregations that are studying under skilled master teachers. But finally, what was preached and what was taught is brought down to the home level. And they're discussing it. We're talking about how this relates to our life as doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs. How we're able to carry on day by day the great thing we've heard preached about the great God and the great principles and doctrines that we've been taught are now made very practical in our lives. Some have suggested that these small groups grew out of the persecution of the church. Every one of these passages we cited was before the great persecution began. Something else must explain it. I believe it's the felt and the real need for living, vibrant fellowship that that small group alone, nearly, can, uh, can give. Now there are some factors that really enable me to have hope that this will carry on the proper teaching of God. It is psychologically sound, there's no doubt about it. And Jesus wants it done. But by definition, when we say a small group or a house church, we mean people that have been bound together by their faith in Jesus, but also by their similarity in culture or in desire to work but it's all to carry out the great commission of Christ. To see that the gospel is preached to every creature. And for that to happen in a city, there must be a meeting in every single neighborhood. Maybe on every city block. There need, you need to know that on Tuesday night or Monday night or Wednesday night or Friday night, a group meets in this house to open the book, to look at Jesus, and to make the response that is proper to that look. It is to provide a, a small and vital group fellowship, opportunities for mutual encouragement, to share in prayer, to encourage us to meet each other's needs, to provide a means for a new convert, a new Christian, to become immediately involved in the work of the local church, to build disciples capable of planning and carrying out the great commission of Christ. There it's Jesus that will meet the need. There it's Jesus that will be magnified. There it's Jesus that will carry on the great work of his life. Of course we'll beware of boasting. We won't boast. It's Jesus that's doing the work. Of course we'll beware of legalistic pressure that makes you feel like you're not righteous unless you're attending this, this local group. Of course we'll, be, be, we'll beware of any domination by any one person that will lead to a cultic arrangement. Of course we'll be careful to keep the target of evangelizing the world always upon our mind. Of course, we'll be aware of the danger of developing a pharisaical attitude that makes us more righteous than others. We will invite people to be a part of our group. We'll invite people to come and share. We will not in any way pressure them or intimidate them. We'll trust God. And of course, we'll be aware that this group is a part of the whole group and not a group in and of itself. But what would it be like? What will that small group will be like? What features in the small groups in the New Testament day and in this day brings health and builds a strong, vibrant body? Number one, they talk about Jesus. It is Jesus that's the real leader of this group. He is alive. They read, his, they read the Gospels and he acts and they see it. He speaks and they hear it. He leads and they follow. He disciplines and they're corrected. He teaches and they learn. He loves and they respond. He's working in their life and they're better. He sets their tongues loose and they speak. I've been a part of small groups. I know that I leave every small group looking for somebody to share with about what I've just learned. That's number one. They talk about Jesus. Number two, they care about each other. You see, they know each other. They know each other intimately. 
because of the itinerary that they're following of looking at Jesus day by day, they're learning falteringly, little by little, to love one another with a deep kind of love. And that small group meeting never ends. It goes on after you leave the house. If the problem, uh, if a problem within an individual member is mentioned, chances are he'll receive, he or she will receive several calls during the week. I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. How's your problem going? One of the benefits of this caring acceptance and expression of love between brothers and sisters is that they quickly come to know and accept the fact that God loves them. That's the only way you could explain people loving each other like that is the fact that they know they're loved by God. They talk about Jesus. They care about each other. Number three, they pray. And they don't pray the now lay me down to sleep prayers. I mean, they pray the urgent prayers. They pray particularly for each other. One of these days, it might be good for us to have a 12 lesson uh, tape, series of tape, videotapes on just prayer. Because you see, the New Testament is filled with the prayers of brethren for each other as well as prayers of thanksgiving to God. Number four, they share their faith. They have, a, they have something to share. And it's not their complaints. It's not their problems that they share mostly. Mostly they share their faith. Here's a, a quote from a letter I received from a person that I'd helped learn about small groups. She wrote to say, in our meetings we read about and talk about Jesus. You have to decide for yourself if Christ is real. If he is, what does that mean in your life? As we study and pray from week to week, we see that he's doing things in our life that we've never seen before. A neighbor comes over and shares a problem with us. Pretty soon, in helping with a problem, we're talking about Jesus. And he's led to a faith and a belief in Christ. Isn't that good? It's what Paul said in Philippians 2, starting with verse 12. He says, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure, that you might become blameless and harmless, children of God, without spot, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding forth the word of truth. This lady spoke of the light that people saw in their small group arrangement. The same thing is mentioned in Revelation 12, in verse 11, where John sees around the throne the redeemed. And how does he describe the redeemed? As the overcomers. And he says they overcame because of the blood of Christ, the cross because of the word of their testimony. They're sharing what they know and they love not their lives even unto death. Just a few days ago, a fellow told me in a small group, he said there's no way that I would ever speak up in the assembly, in the celebration. And in Bible classes, I'm out of place sometimes I feel if I interrupt the teacher. He said, but in this group, I feel absolutely free to speak. That's what I'm talking about. They share their faith. The key to telling others has never been to train the flesh to do it, to find some insurance manual and teach us how to close sales and make presentations. The key since century one has always been to get to Christians so full of Jesus, so full of the Holy Spirit, that those around him are caught in the spontaneous overflow. A flowing oil well pays much more than one that you have to pump the oil out of. Life in small groups helps keep the believer open for the continual filling of the Holy Spirit and kept full, we will tell. Number five, they see God's power. They see the marvelous, magnificent power of God alive and working in the lives of ordinary people. In one small group that I was involved with, one man who had received absolutely no help from several psychiatrists was brought to total peace 
by the experience of the small group. Like the lady in the book of Mark and Luke who had spent all of her money trying to get doctors to cure her of her bleeding. When she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, when she finally came in contact with Christ, she was healed from that which doctors could never help her. In that same small group, a hopeless alcoholic received the will to quit and stay quit. And now five years later, he still quit. In another small group, a divided home where a man and a wife had already filed divorce papers were led to peace and security. And now they're not only are living together, he's preaching the gospel of Christ. I've seen in small groups souls that were bitter against God won to absolute loving service to him. I mean we see the power of God in the life of people. Number six, they engage in service. Not forced, not phony service, but real service. One small group decided that it wanted to get involved in the feeding of the hungry. So it made a plan how it would have a daily soup kitchen in a bad part of town. They took that plan to the elders of the church. The elders approved it, and without any money from anybody's budget, they themselves purchased, staffed, and fed people from that soup kitchen for six long years that's been going on. Number seven, they grow. In small groups, people grow in a marvelous, fabulous way. They grow because finally they get to where their gifts can be exercised. We're not in the study of spiritual gifts. But if you'll tonight read 1 Corinthians 12, the whole chapter, in Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, in Ephesians 4, the first 16 verses, you'll see the concept of giftedness, that God has given to each one of his children some gift, exhortation, showing mercy with cheerfulness, giving with liberality, exhorting, teaching, faith, wisdom, so many present gifts in the church are mentioned in those passages. Where are those going to be, where are those going to be exercised? In a congregation like the one where I attend where we have a couple of thousand people in the worship service, there's no way over a dozen people are going to be involved and only two or three of them in a speaking capacity. And in Bible classes, just so many classes, just so many teachers, where are people going to be able to exercise those spiritual gifts? Where can the sweet ladies manifest their spiritual giftedness the best? It's not in the assembly. Surely it's not in adult Bible classes. It's in their domain. It's where they are queen. When I enter a household, I enter the woman's domain. Paul says she is to rule the household in 1 Peter chapter 5. Small gifts give us the opportunity to exercise our mutual giftedness. We also grow by the experience of one another relationships. That's another study. If you would look up in your concordance the two words, one another, and see that the Bible says we are to bear one another's burdens. We are to admonish one another. We are to rebuke one another. We are to consider one another better than others. We are to urge one another on into love and good works. We are to love one another. All those one another passages, where are those going to be fulfilled? Those can't be fulfilled in any large degree in the celebration or in the Bible classes. It's in the home. It's in the small groups that those can best be done. And they also grow by the mutual experience in the Word of God as they hear the Word of God, as they study the Word of God, and as they see the Word of God living in the lives of these people that they're bound to in this small group. They grow. They grow marvelously because of the exercise of mutual gifts, because of the experience of mutual love and because of the mutual experience in the word of God that day. Number eight, they learn to trust the Lord. My favorite passage, maybe in all the Bible, has to be Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, all things are worked together for good. I trust God in that way. There's a divine work here. God works. There's a thorough work here. God works all things. There's a beneficial work here. God works all things together for good. It's a discriminant work though to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. But it's an assured work. I love those first words. For 
we know. I'd rather know one thing for sure, be certain about one single thing, than have doubtful knowledge about a thousand. And this one thing I know, no matter what happens, God works together for good. I can hear that preached and it thrills me. I can hear that taught and it fills me. But it's only when I'm in that small group that it instills in me the faith to go out to work. I need the filling. I need the thrilling. But I also need the instilling. I need it instilled within me that I may know that the Lord will be with me in all that I do. Then last of all, number nine. Here is a great factor that brings health. They have life. You know, I can go to worship service and, and be all torn up inside and I don't really get the life that I'm really desiring and needing. Same thing when I study with someone else, I hear someone else teach or if I'm studying the Bible by myself. But if I can open up and, and share my insides with a group and see Jesus living in them, then I'm becoming conscious now of how Jesus lives in the body called the church because he lives in these bodies called my brothers and my sisters and I really am turned on by that and they're conscious that the, not only are they conscious that Christ lives in the body but they're conscious that the body lives in Christ when I see people that are by natural tendency very very timid when I see them in a small group come out boldly with their faith and make statements, either in a confessing way, but not normally is that true, in a bold, progressive way, to say, I believe these things to be true. And they're aware that there is much more life to have than they presently have. I love to see the older brother, as he expresses his depth of faith, and see the weaker brother turn on and buy into that, and express in a more bold way than ever before his faith. Let me say it again. The church will multiply when the seed is sown abundantly in all the city. It will be sown abundantly, not by the celebration or by the Bible class, but by the small group. May God make us a missionary on our block using our home as the evangelistic center. Go preach the word to every creature. God bless you. Well, thank you for your attention there. Let me remind you a little bit of, uh, of some of what he said. First of all, that was a Timothy passage. Not a, Paul didn't write anything in First Peter. Uh, the, uh, it's nice to know even the really, even really fine preachers. Boy, does he, does he teach. And I, I, personally, I wasn't a month old, maybe two months old as a Christian, and I got to hear Richard Rogers give a lesson in Indianapolis we drove all the way from, from Columbus, Ohio, over to the next state and had a weekend seminar. And I, to this day, remember his specific points of the first lesson I heard him teach. It affected me then, and it has changed me my whole life. Um, and I, I don't have any loyalty to any individuals, only to Christ, but, uh, but I do have an appreciation for that man knowing how to teach the, the, the scriptures. Uh, he, he set my, uh, my sail uh, early. He talked about fears, fears that hinder, divisions in the church, the fact that uh, the scripture repeatedly deals with not being divided and our, our awareness, um, a false doctrinal possibilities, uh, that's uh, a fear, but of course we would, uh, we would make sure that, that small groups are healthy, well-led, well-ordered. Uh, well uh, and then legalism, and he talked about psychological excess. I think he's talking about control, excessive issues of control, of somebody uh, uh, pushing or being uh, authoritative in the wrong way in a, in a small group. So those are the, the, uh, the, the fears. Uh, he talked about the New Testament pattern. And if you go to, to um, uh, Romans 16, there's at least five small group setting, or, or church house settings listed, 
and, uh, and maybe six, depending on how you take the churches of the Gentiles phrase. Which brings me to, to this, his explanation, uh, a very interesting, a very nice explanation of, of the assembly, the assembly of the whole body meeting together as we did this morning. The Bible study time, this time, which is less than that because it's not everybody. We, we divide it up in the Bible classes. Uh, women are encouraged to teach women. Uh, we have classes that, that focus on different studies. And then, the, and then the groups from Acts 2 on that met in the home, that there were people who met in each other's homes, that they constantly went to each other's homes, and they obviously did that. I like the emphasis he put that Romans 15 is a full uh, generation later from what's going on in Acts chapter 2. Decades and decades went by uh, before Romans uh, 16 was a fact. So this is a pattern they continue to do. Um, the assembly on the first day of the week, Bible studies uh, as they make sense, and then meeting in, in, in homes to build up and strengthen. How much it meets needs, and we didn't even, he didn't even get into how many different ways that small groups meets needs. Um, when you think about the 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 dire need, the, the, the yearning need of a brand new Christian to have a place they called home, to, to have a, a group of people uh, they call friends. Uh, Lauren will get into this more. He might have mentioned it. Um, I, I get, I've heard him teach this two times, so I don't remember which one he mentioned when. But he talked about in Thailand how much um, they have to abandon, their family abandons them, how much they abandon, they're abandoned by their society and how much a rejection of their own country and, and people it is to say, I am a Christian, not a Buddhist. And how much a, fam a, a home group um, gives them a home, gives them friends, gives them an identity, gives them a place where they can finally relax, breathe, and talk to somebody who speaks like they do and thinks like they do. Uh, and how many different needs. He, he, he gave a long list of needs. Um, and then factors that give hope. He talked about the definition of, uh, of being bound together, of, of sharing your faith, sharing your focus, purpose, the purpose of evangelism, how naturally that fits into a small group, that it doesn't fit into the Sunday assembly, etc. cetera. Um, uh, growth for the members, uh, fellowship, etc. cetera. He talked about principles, um, the focus on Jesus, the fact that how natural it is uh, to talk about Christ and about your fair and, your faith and walk in Christ. And the last category he had up there was features uh, that bring health. They talk about Jesus. They care about each other. They pray together. They share uh, their lives uh, and their faith. Uh, they see God's power. They serve. They grow. They use the gifts that God gives us. Uh, they apply the 70 some one another passages uh, to each other. Uh, in that setting. Uh, they learn to trust the Lord and they have real lives. They have life and uh, they sense it and feel it. That was his uh, lesson on it. Uh, I want to say quickly that uh, we, we haven't talked about uh, uh, any firm pattern of structure if we go to this. We have talked about the idea of starting four or five, a small number of groups uh, that would be settled, firm, uh, that wouldn't be, be uh, 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 ones we could shake up. And that when you get past 12, you get to 16, 18 people meeting in a group, well, then you divide and create two groups out of that, natural growth, um, because you really don't want more than 12 long-term in a small group. Lauren will talk about that more uh, in his lessons. Um, and we've talked about a training a preparation time for those who are going to be uh, leading, um, caring for small groups or hosting them in their homes uh, so that there's always somebody there to direct, lead, and be careful with the group, uh, considerate of, of what its goals are and how it, how it works, and then somebody else who's prepared when that group grows to take it to their home. So there's always a, 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 a couple of trained people uh, in the group who can, uh, who can help the the group to grow and that uh, naturally we would let these groups grow uh, as and let them be uh, associated to people if if geography is the best way for you to choose which group you're, you would be a part of uh, you, then you just pick the one closest if uh, 
if there's a group of, uh, with a lot of little children and that's a great place for you to be with your children, then you choose that one. If it's a group of young couples, if it's a group of older couples, whatever it might be, that, that, the, that we let the groups uh, form themselves and grow uh, more naturally. Uh, it's not a decision, but it is something we're looking at and very serious about. Um, the, the focus on evangelism and the focus on, on the, power, the growth and the, and the, the needs of the, uh, of the body is so, so uh, wonderful. It's very encouraging to look at something like this uh, that has this much effect. When the uh, bakers come back from, um, from Mexico, uh, they talk about people getting together in their homes every night of the week. When Lauren and I come back from Thailand, we talk about groups that are getting together all the time and they stay long into the night uh, with each other. We're talking about two societies there that were not created around the automobile. And in most, not, I mean, not in, in Leon, they have to use buses to, to, tra- to traverse the country. And of course, in Thailand, in both those cases, there are so few Christians in the immediate area. Some people travel a long way in. But still, those societies have not been built so much in the 20th century like ours has to where we're really spread out. Um, so the idea of being able to walk somewhere and to naturally spend time in your neck of the, of the neighborhood or of the city um, uh, is a little more natural in older countries than it is uh, in, our, uh, in our country. Um, but that's just a, a, a physical uh, detail. Questions? Are there any questions before we, we prepare to wrap up? Just, yes, Jim. It's not a question, but in the 1940s, the Church of Christ was the fastest growing religious body in the United States. Mm-hmm. They did it with this method. Okay. Thank you. You said you would start five or six groups with 12 people of peace in them? I, I, said, I did say four, maybe five, but go ahead. I tried to say that. I hope I did. In mathematics, that only adds up to about 48 to 60 people. Right. Because we need to let it grow naturally. If we, I would think if we'd done this before, we created 12 groups, you know, and it, only three, only five of them lasted past the first couple of weeks, and then they fizzled out. If we created five groups that had 20 people at each one, wow, that's wonderful. Okay, and within a month, we're going to have 10 groups because we'll take all those and divide them up um, and, and, and that sort of thing, and then let those grow. That's what I mean about natural growth. We are, we are overseers not directors so we don't I don't see our place would be directing people into this sort of thing um, and CB Dave and I haven't talked this all the way down the line so I don't want to get too far into that but that's what I mean about starting and letting it grow naturally letting um, you know this the second service uh, is is being affected by your choices not by our organization of first and second services. People are being wonderfully cooperative about it, but it's obvious uh, of the problems that it's causing to the, to the members. And so this would hopefully be part of that solution of how to help relationships and how to help grow, independent of whether we have one or two services. That's not the same subject. Um, but uh, it would be the choice of the members. Yes, 5 times 12 is only 60, and we have 200 people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, the, uh, that's a good question, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, and TNT. The, the, the TNT might be a natural youth group that just continues, and they would join their own families. The men's group might be a natural men's group that just continues, but we would have a, a small group that we would be, be associated with as we chose. Um, the, uh, but, I don't know, we'll see. Yes? No, it would not replace second service. We could do it independent of how we had second service. Although Sunday night is a rather natural time with the history of Churches of Christ having six o'clock services, Sunday night ends up being rather a natural time for people to have small groups. But there's nothing wrong with a Thursday, Friday night small group either to the group that that fits their schedule better. Yes? 
There's no thought, no conversation about uh, changing anything about midweek service. There's no conversation. And these are not the same discussion as to whether or not to have uh, two services on Sunday or small groups. It's not one or the other. Those are independent uh, concepts. It's simply uh, this thing came up this summer. Uh, Lauren was here. We talked about it. He said, well, you know, we asked him, would you be interested in teaching a class on this? So this happened as a, as a teaching opportunity uh, not as a not coinciding. Now, if God's coinciding them, that's His business, and we'll we'll submit to Him. But uh, it's nothing we plan. Any thoughts, comments? Thank you very much. Look up the scriptures on it. Pray about this. Uh, and and Lauren uh, has worked with them for years uh, in this concept, and he will be continue to teach. He has three more lessons, um, and we'll we'll teach for the next three Sundays. Uh, and continue this study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Wonderful, powerful, heavenly Father, you are a great Lord, and thank you for showing us in your word uh, concepts of patterns that we uh, should be learning from, uh, ways to gather with one another, uh, to grow and encourage each other, that we might be the the congregation, the kingdom uh, here that you want us to be. Uh, Watch over us as we go from here. Help us to have a good week to glorify you every day. Uh, We pray for those out hunting and those traveling long distances, going back to work and all the busyness of the week. We pray that you can be the guide in the center of it, that you will be the one who uh, manages and leads our days. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all very much.